snakes are like mosquitoes. They need to be eradicated. Like that, that's the trajectory that I saw. And I wanted to put that vision into our organization that, okay, no, snakes are a critically important part of our world's biodiversity. If you take snakes out of an ecosystem, you know, <laughs> you know, birds that eat snakes are not gonna have their prey, you know, even monkeys eat snakes, you know, so there's a lot of animals that eat snakes for their prey. And then snakes are an incredible, um, you know, form of pest control. So they're an important predator themselves, obviously. Um, a, a fantastic one that I, I really like to talk about is in Colombia. Julio Mor uh, Morales is a, a conservationist that is working with the Hoshul's forest racer. And so this snake is pretty interesting. It's a, a colubrid species, um, pretty, I don't know, just a, a pretty green snake but it was lost to science for 70 years. And um, his team actually rediscovered it um, in a preserve in Colombia. Episode number 112 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Michael Starkey, who is the executive director and the founder of Save the Snakes. Save the Snakes is an organization that is dedicated to global snake conservation and is also dedicated to mitigating human snake conflict. In the episode, Michael tells us why he decided to start Save the Snakes. It all really came down to when the WHO classified snake bite as a neglected tropical disease. And Michael saw that as an immediate threat to snake populations just by the, by associating snake with disease and how you know humans that aren't snake lovers are going to react to that message. And I think he was completely correct in that, in that thinking. So he created Save the Snakes. And in the episode, we discuss how he started it, what it does, and the projects that they fund. We also discuss some other random things like how they're monkey projects that Michael has worked on. Of course, we discuss snake bite in detail, what to do if you are bitten by a snake, how to educate communities on snake bite, especially communities in third world countries that are really heavily impacted by snake bite. And we wrap up the conversation with where Michael sees Save the Snakes headed, what he has planned in sort of the next five to 10 years on a large scale. If you're looking for more information on this episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you'll find the show notes for all the episodes. You can also find links to buy sweaters or t-shirts. If you do buy a sweater or a t-shirt, $5 is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. If you liked this episode or enjoyed this episode, share it on social media. Another great thing that you guys can do, and I know a lot of you are already doing this, is just reach out to the guests and let them know you listen to them on the podcast and you enjoyed the episode. I already hear from so many guests saying that they hear from the listeners and they really do enjoy it. So that's one easy way that you can show support to the show. If you also want to join us on Patreon, head to patreon.com slash animals at home. There you have early access to episodes. You have the opportunity to submit questions to guests. I give you guys an insight on the analytics of the podcast. And we also do hangouts on Zoom, usually about once a month. And we have a really cool one coming up on December 4th. So if you do sign up before then, you can be part of that. And as always, thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for anything reptile related, head to the affiliate links in the YouTube description or the show notes. Those are an affiliate link. So if you do make a purchase there, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. Okay, let's jump into this episode with Michael Starkey. Enjoy. Well, Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, and it's it's very nice to be here. So thanks for having uh, having us on. I cannot wait to get into the topics we're going to get into today, but why don't we just kind of start with a little bit of a general background and introduction to yourself. So maybe you could tell us, you know, how you got into working with animals and some of the education that you have had through the, the last few years. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's, it's always kind of weird to talk about yourself. Um, <laughs> but like, I guess, you know, I think many people who are interested in reptiles and amphibians have like a similar path. It's like you either caught like a garter snake or frogs when you were a kid, or you kept them in shoe boxes or something yeah. like in your closet. <laughs> right. And I think it was the same for me. And I grew up in like the city of Sacramento, California, I'm definitely a city kid. There wasn't really much nature. Um, didn't really go out to nature very often. Um, but my parents took me to the zoo, a local zoo. Um, we went to, you know, to pet shops and stuff. And we always had animals actually in our house. And, you know, at a young age, I was like, oh, you know, I, I really like lizards. And I, you know, I, I'm a, uh, a 90s kid. So I grew up like watching Mutual of Omaha and like Animal Planet when it 
you know, was still kind of good. Yeah. <laughs> like, cause now it's like really sensationalized. Right. But, um, but just, so that kind of media and like the exposure to animals in a captive environment was really influential. And so by the time I was like 16, I was really obsessed with snakes. Um, and so much that my parents like let me have a room full of snakes. Uh, and I was like breeding boa constrictors and dumeral monitors. Uh, I had like all the, you know, crested geckos, lichianus, like was getting really into that. Um, and I was, you know, working at a pet store and it's just kind of like, that was like the, the captive environment, um, side of things like the herpetoculture. So would that have been sort of mid two thousands then like 2005, 2006 type thing? Uh, it was like probably, yeah, basically I would say like, you know, 2000 to 2005. Yeah. Cause okay. that's, that's yeah. actually when I was in high school and that's when I was uh, attending our local, um, uh, herpological society meetings, you know, I was dragging friends to these meetings, Awesome. you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, a nerdy snake kid, but it was also like in the punk rock and metal. So it was like the combination. It's like either let's go do a nerdy snake event or go like see a punk show. It's like yeah. those, those two things. Um, but that was, those, uh, those experiences were really important because I really saw the kind of captive side of things. Um, but being involved in my local herpological society, we also got speakers from you know, that were doing research in Ecuador or studying tiger salamanders in California. And I was kind of like my world opened up from like the captive side of things. So like, oh, okay. So if you actually want to pursue this as a career, it's like, you know, being a vet or a zookeeper aren't your only options or opening a pet store, right? There's like mm -hmm. more things you could do. Um, and I was very fortunate to have a, a community college professor uh, come into the pet store I was working at and say, hey, you like snakes? You should come with me to the Mojave Desert. And uh, so, and I was like, really, I was not a good student. And so I was like struggling in high school, barely making it out there. Um, and just, you know, it was just, yeah, hard time. And so going to community college and then being exposed to like, oh, there's actually classes where you can get school credit to go down the Mojave Desert mm -hmm. and like do research with scientists. And that was a really uh, transformative uh, moment that got me into the research side, side of things. And, you know, and then you're staying up till three in the morning, like catching rattlesnakes and, you know, having a good time. Uh, and long story short, it was kind of like um, the, the next pivotal moment of like kind of the academic side of like taking courses in, in university and, you know, just learning about the research side of things while also maintaining like a ever smaller growing collection. Mm -hmm. Cause the more you, have I don't know for me it was like I just had less and less time because I was spending more time away from my animals um and I started working with animals in the wild um I got a job working with um as a like a technician working with giant garter snakes and so uh you're you're in Canada right that's right yeah so what what garter snakes it's the Sertalis that you have up there right yeah we have the red sided and uh, they're there's an, I think it's mostly Man like in Manitoba is where that Narciss snake pit is. So I'm not sure mm. if you're familiar with that. So that's only a few hours from where I live and that's all red sided garter snakes. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the holy grail. I, I really want to go up there one day. Get you up. Um, and I, I hate to say it. I've never even actually been, so I shouldn't brag about it too much, but <laughs> it's on well, my list of things to do. It's garter snakes, I think are really interesting. Um, just, you know, they're, I don't know. They're sort of this like ubiquitous snake that everyone in North America, at least like yeah. they're usually around like a, a type of garter snake. And so where I live, I'm very fortunate that we have this species called the giant garter snake. And it's a Bamnophis gigas. It's the, the largest and most aquatic of all garter snake species um, in the world. And it's endemic to the central valley of California, uh, you know, which historically would have been you know, marshes and just, um, you know, lots of um, ephemeral wetlands, but now it's been really, um, you know, basically destroyed by agriculture and development yeah. and, you know, cattle grazing. And so the, the habitat has shrunk uh, for this species. Um, and so basically right out of high school, um, this biologist gave me the job of a lifetime, basically catching snakes all season for research. Um, and that, was it for me that was like i want to do for this for the rest of my life uh you know have 60 hour weeks you know catching you know snakes these endangered snakes and you know uh putting transmitters in them and watching their movements and seeing you know what they do and um you know presented some of that research at um some events and conferences and things like that and it just kind of started transitioning from again this like herpetoculture real interest to like oh, okay you can study these in in the wild and 
Um, and then, yeah, when we're getting to work with snakes and, and also doing it seasonally was good because then you could do schoolwork or um, for me, it was kind of a combination of like struggling with school and then doing summer catching snakes. But then I started working um, with California tiger salamanders and California red-legged frogs. And by the time I was 23, I, I was very fortunate to have a, a resume that was like five pages long because I kept doing seasonal jobs, mm -hmm. working with different like threatened and endangered species. Um, and not everyone can have that experience, right? Because like, you know, I'll, I'll be completely honest, like I had great parents and they let me live at home. And so I was just doing that at home, you know, like, and I think in today's world, it's even harder for you know, kids to, when they're in school to survive now. Um, so I had that support structure, which allowed me those opportunities. Um, and I just want to make that a point because like, not everyone can, can do that. Right. Cause if you're struggling to, you know, pay rent and, you know, or make rent and go to school, it can be really tough to juggle that stuff. Um, but yeah, so long story short, like it was kind of like these experiences in California, um, you know, led me to wanting to see international things and, uh, one winter, um, I received an opportunity to volunteer uh, for a, a doctorate student's work with frogs in Panama. And that that really kind of changed everything, because once I spent a, a few months in the rainforest, I never wanted to leave. And yeah. so well, I always say there's that there, if you've never been into a rainforest, it's that that experience of walking into one for the first time. It's just it will never leave you. It's just yeah. such a powerful impact, and I think that's one of the the sad things about rainforest conservation is it's hard to con it's it's hard to convey that message through even like images and video and whatnot. It's mm -hmm. like you have to be there and experience it. And there's something like so uh, primal about being in a forest like that. It's it's a strange experience. It's amazing. Yeah, and I think you know for for people depending on their interests, they may it, they could get the same experience from like being on a tundra or being in like open mm -hmm. plains and you know Nebraska or something. But like. For me, it was like when I saw like a like a buttress tree, um, you yeah. know, like, you know, like these huge, you know, uh, Kapok trees or Sabas and like with these just giant buttress roots. And then you're like always peering over them because in every like, you know, guide, there's like a fertilance or some other venomous snake coiled up at the bottom. Um, you know, that's just a, it was a transformative experience. And so. Yeah. And, and that's like, that's kind of what introduced me to working in the tropics um, and then trying to find ways to get back to the tropics. And so, you know, basically the next 10 years was just, um, you know, a combination of like leading eco tours to, to Belize, to um, uh, Costa Rica, Ecuador, uh, working seasonal jobs, uh, working for the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, doing crane surveys and migratory bird surveys because it wasn't just herps like that I worked with like I, I sort of juggled um, different work as I as I could find it and so you know I I worked doing salmon uh, research as well so you know uh, counting basically uh, salmon populations as they moved up the Yuba River in California um, and I even worked with howler monkeys in Belize, which yeah, I saw that on your bio. I wanted to talk to you about yeah. that as well. What was that like? <laughs> so like that was um, again another really amazing experience uh, and un unexpected because I'm not I'm not a fan of monkeys uh, really at all. <laughs> like they're interesting, but I'm I am truly a hurt person, and like I, you know, I get the most excited over seeing a snake, but a little frog will do the same too. Um, and and I think like howler monkeys were sort of like a ticket to working in the tropics, you know, it was like that combination. Um, but yeah, so the kind of the, what's led to that was, um, I was in this, you know, period of my life. It's like, okay, where, where do I want to go? It's like, do I, do I pursue a PhD and go into academia? Do I, you know, kind of stay at home in California and pursue consulting as a career? So, uh, you know, if, you know, for people who may not know, like, um, you know, environmental consulting, if, in California, we have some of the strictest laws in the United States for uh, biological resources, so protecting our environment. And so whenever there's a development, so whether they're building a Walmart or they're building, you know, a zoo, it doesn't really matter. You have to follow certain laws. And biologists are actually employed to make sure that companies aren't, you know, breaking the laws and, you know, cutting down endangered bird, you know, nests and, you know, squishing snakes and stuff like that. And so that kind of like was the paying work, right? But trying to get back to the tropics was always like a goal and trying to find a way to like make that into a livelihood as well. Um, 
was, you know, that was important to me um, if I could make it happen. And many people will go and like, all right, I'm going to go get a PhD in like Panama and study this frog for four years and do it that way. Um, but I was struggling with academia because it was like, I didn't want to focus on one thing. I, I was more of a generalist. I wanted to do different things. Um, and I was getting more interested in wildlife conservation because in a lot of my travels and in the work I was doing, it was all threatened and endangered species. And especially working on development projects, you know, it can be really disheartening to, you know, see beautiful wildlife habitat that you know is going to get wiped out to build like a subdivision, you know, yeah. like a bunch of homes. Um and so I, I kind of in my 20s just really had this growing like urge to want to protect stuff, you know, and even getting to a point where it was like, you know, trying to direct that through activism. And, you know, because there's a lot of that happening for different, very different causes. But for me, the environment and protecting wildlife was very important to me. And so the a fantastic opportunity arose when um, some friends had actually a research center in, in Belize. And they were, you know, creating this center where they could have scientists come and basically conduct research in this really pristine rainforest in the Maya Mountains in Belize. And they actually, this the the couple who runs it, they're actually from Canada as well. And so they kind of, when they were starting it, they had to go back and forth from Belize to Canada. And they were like, hey, do you want to, you know, kind of watch it for a few months while we figure some things out in Canada? And so for three months, I got to manage the station. And That's so amazing. Yeah. And this is like, like we had, we had all, so if you can just imagine like you know, this rolling hillscape of mountains and, you know, basically forest and, and it was connected to like this kind of river system and there would be all these trails. And so there were ocelots and, you know, margays, so cats and, um, you know, monkeys and parrots and all kinds of cool herbs, uh, like from fertilants to coral snakes and, um, you know, really neat rare frogs as well. Um, Belize doesn't have like the diversity of Costa Rica or like Panama, but it still will have more than like the, you know, North Northern, yeah. you know, deciduous you know. forest. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's still like way more interesting. Like they may not have like 300 species of frogs, but they got like 80 and that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you know, or it's not actually 80, but it could be anyway, there's still a lot of research being done. So long story short, um, you know, we had some visiting scientists and a, a scientist uh, from Belize came to do a herb survey nearby. And he was telling me about his work up in northeastern Belize. And he had a position open that was reintroducing um, howler monkeys into a, a section of forest in Belize. Um, this, this population of uh, howler monkeys had been wiped out from yellow fever, like I think maybe 80 years ago at this point. And what they were doing is they were taking howler monkeys and, uh, well, howler monkeys uh, that they're reintroducing and that were taken from the pet trade mostly, or that were found injured and they would rehabilitate them over years of like really dedicated, you know, um, you know, rehabilitation. So these, you know, monkeys go from like eating tortillas and beans to being totally wild animals um, that are thriving. And so my job was like, yeah working with a community that lived in the preserve and then helping, you know, arrange basically the, the transport to get these monkeys out into the uh, preserve and then releasing them and then tracking their progress with a, with a team of Belizeans. It was an incredible experience. That is amazing. Um, How did yeah. they do? Did they do okay once they were released or? Yeah, it's actually surprising they do. And so um, this, um, this kind of, if, if anyone is interested in like how animals get released to the wild, there's kind of this concept of like a soft release and a hard release. And a hard release is basically like you get the animal and you just let it go and it's like good luck. Um, mm -hmm. But with the soft release, it's basically, so one, the animals had years to kind of like get used to, um, you know, go from having, uh, you know, hands on with, with keepers who are, you know, really maintaining their needs. And then they get like larger and larger enclosures. So to the point where before release, they're in, you know, um, like a quarter acre, or like a few hectare, basically fenced in pen that they're allowed to be a, um, be a monkey. And then they get supplemental feedings and then come release time. It's kind of similar. Like they'll be set up in an enclosure for a few days. They get acclimated to the environment and then they're tracked for um, usually about 90 days to so sometimes even three months. So you can imagine this is like very expensive um, to have people tracking monkeys. Um, because with these monkeys, like we're not able to put collars on them. It was actually more 
economical to just have people watching the monkeys. Like, and oh, so, wow. <laughs> so yeah. their tracking was actually just people watching them. Yeah. So what we would do is we would basically, and this is, um, yeah, this is very, very few trails, uh, just walking through the jungle basically. And you would just be, sta- you know, you and a, 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 your partner would be standing watching these monkeys all day. Um, <laughs> And it's just tracking their progress and taking notes and seeing how they're doing. You know, are they eating? Um, are they, you know, are they coming back down? Cause that's the biggest problem. Cause if a monkey comes down to the forest, it's going to get eaten by something. Um, and that was a concern, but it was, it was something like 90% of monkeys during this time will make it. It might, it might have even been higher. Um, I think that was actually the survival rate, you know, because these monkeys, like they don't necessarily have the same predators they would even in like a large pen. Right. So because there's, you know, cats that'll take them. There's these um, relatives of weasels called Tyra, which are incredible predators that will take them, you know, uh, hawks and, you know, obviously a large boa constrictor will take like a howler monkey. And so they may not get exposed to that. Um, but during this, like, you know, like 90 day period, they, they survive. And now um, after years of relocations, these monkeys are thriving, they're breeding, and there's a looks like a sustainable population where there once wasn't that is Um, incredible yeah so what about the communities that you said live in the preserve are they are they stoked about having howler monkeys back or because you never know how people are going to react to having because howler monkeys are quite loud for anyone that hasn't heard yeah it's quite a strange noise they make but how did the locals respond to it so i think you could look at it like this like imagine like the things that we hear in our environment that are really common right so like we get accustomed to car alarms and police sirens and, yeah. you know, noisy, you know, intersections and stuff like that or trains. Uh, and for them, a howler monkey is just another part of their environment and it's not actually a bad one. Um, so howler monkeys are interesting because they, and I know we're like supposed to talk snakes and we're like going no, no. to this animals, monk, whatever it is, <laughs> monkey yeah. tangent, but, um, this, uh, you know, like howler monkeys usually call, um, you know, not only for like defending their territory when other monkeys are calling and only the males will really make that really loud call, which you can hear from miles away. Um, but they'll call when it's raining, like when rain is coming, like they kind of are like are upset about it because <laughs> they, they know they're going to have to hunker down and stuff. So, you know, they can kind of be like, oh, I think it's going to rain. And it's like, yeah, the monkeys are calling. Um, but the community they're uh, they were important. They, they were actually critical for the success of this program because, they act as, you know, kind of not only are they the people that live there and they sort of, you know, because they use the resources of the forest, right? They actually log in the forest. So sustainable logging, you know, they're planting and harvesting things from the forest and also hunting in the forest as well. And so getting game. And this particular community sort of became really impassioned about the, the animals and the team that they were working with. Um, and it was, you know, it was a partnership. And so, And this is actually a great segue into the work that Save the Snake supports because communities are first and uh, um, foremost to successful wildlife conservation. Because if if scientists and researchers from like a faraway place go and like, you know, tell a community, hey, you need to like have this wildlife because it's important to like Western people, that's Mm -hmm. not going to work, you know, Uh, because wildlife causes problems for people. Like, you know, think of... Think about it like in North America where we live, you know, like coyotes and like raccoons, you know, coming into our trash and like we pay a pest control guy to like, you know, basically off them, (laughs) you know, and that's like an acceptable form of wildlife management. Well, the same is true for if you look at communities in like Africa that deal with elephants, like Mm -hmm. elephants destroy crops, they kill people like, you know, and, you know, we want to save them. It's it's a very different relationship. And so this community in Belize, granted, like howler monkeys are not problems to people. Like they, they're actually very helpful. They're seed dispersers and, you know, they're just a good thing for the environment to have. They don't cause problems to people. They might be a little noisy sometimes, but, mm-hmm. um, but that community in this particular reserve was so critical to the success because they really are, you know, they become interested in the monkeys and then they start, you know, as they go about in the forest, they'll report back to the researchers and say like, oh yeah, I saw this troop over here. You know, they were doing this thing and maybe you guys should come check it out. And then, so they're actually acting as like citizen scientists in a way. Um, And so 
also too, if there's threats to, you know, the, the monkeys, like if they're not feeling well, they get sick or something, or if there might be an outside threat, like for example, logging is a big issue in parts of Belize. And um, there were times that there was illegal logging, logging happening. And so, you know, if a giant, you know, save a tree, which is this huge giant tree, that's really important for howler monkeys. If it gets cut down, it's good to have eyes on that and to sort of, you know, be able to just, um, you know, if there's any accountability that can be taken, it, it can be done, or there could be more measures to prevent it in the future. Um, but having like the community involved is just, it's, it's a tool for wildlife conservation. It's actually a really important component for successful wildlife conservation. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, well, that, and I, I, we're definitely going to get into that because I'm super curious about how you incorporate that into Save the Snakes. So why don't we talk about Save the Snakes, how, what it is, and, and I guess first, why did you decide to start it? Was there a moment that happened that you're like, I'm going to, I need to go ahead and do something or did it something that's just, you've had in the works for a long time? It's, it's kind of a, it's a mixture of things. It's, um, it's sort of been, I mean, I'm obsessed with snakes. I'm sure like you're up there too. <laughs> like I'm just, yeah. these are really amazing animals and um, you kind of want the world to know it like a little bit. So there's that. And just, so just always having a passion for these animals, thinking they were just, you know, really neat, cool things to not only like keep and see and observe, but also in the wild and just learn more about their behaviors. Um, but also the more I like interacted with people, um, well, that sounds a very strange way of saying that, but just like the, the more people you talk to about snakes, the more you realize, oh yeah, people don't like snakes like at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we're a minority in the world. Um, however, that's changing. Uh, it really is because of, because of animal planet discovery channel, you know, Steve Irwin, you know, YouTube, like, uh, the, the reptiles is becoming a actually really popular thing and it's becoming, you know, like, oh yeah, it's like not you know, crazy to have a pet Python anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, it was still looking at like, okay, people still do have problems with snakes. And like, I remember growing up and, um, you know, moving to like a suburb in California and, you know, found a gopher snake and then like, you know, a bunch of neighbor kids gathered around it. We put it in an aquarium and we were all excited about it. And then the parents like discovered we had the snake and they were convinced it was a rattlesnake mm -hmm. and, you know, they killed it. And it's like, but yeah. it wasn't a rattlesnake and it, and it's that kind of moment stuck with me, um, thinking about like, okay, so there's a lot of, you know, misidentification and confusion and, you know, but people just want to keep their kids safe. Right. And so that's kind of like, you know, snakes have always been this really important thing for me, but that's not the case for other people. And so when you have species of snakes that are actually endangered, so that need conservation action. So like, you know, our logo is a King Cobra. And the reason for that is because the King Cobra might be the most famous threatened snake species. It's, um, you know, it's arguably one of the most famous snakes in the world. It's charismatic. It's just the largest Cobra and the world, largest venomous snake in the world. Um, however, it's, you know, incredibly persecuted by humans. It's, uh, threatened by deforestation, uh, you know, uh, uh, hunting for its, you know, medicinal purposes, like, um, yeah, for its bones and skin and things like that. Um, this snake has a lot of conservation needs, but around the world throughout the range of the King Cobra. So like South Asia and Southeast Asia, if you go into a community or if like, you know, are you trying to bring in a conservation, you know, work to save a King Cobra, they're going to they're going to string you up. Like they're going to yeah. like, you're nuts. You're not going to save a freaking venomous snake, you know, excuse, excuse that like little tangent yeah, yeah. there, but it's, it's true. Like you're not going to save this animal that kills people. Um, however, the King Cobra actually is not a snake that bites people. It's usually the one that's discovered because it's a large snake. You know, when it comes through, you know, forest area into a community, it's big, it gets spotted. And so people see it. But it's not usually the one that kills people. Um, the actual snake bites that occur from other species that are a little bit more secretive, that are going into people's homes looking for food, like, you know, Russell's vipers and crates and other, you know, cobras like monocle cobras or um, uh, Indian cobras. Like those species are the ones that actually are the ones that are responsible for snake bite. And so and they're also common. They're really common mm -hmm. species and they have wide ranges. And so there's no conservation needs for those. but to work with king cobras, you have to say, okay, we need to get people on board to 
say, okay, we can allow conservation action for king cobras, but first you gotta, you gotta go back to those other snakes. You know, how are, how are people getting bitten and killed by those snakes? Um, because that's, that's the other thing that is really important to understand about snake conservation is that snakes kill people. This is a fact. Yeah. And it's, and it's not like a trivial fact because in the West, you know, like a lot of people, I'll, I'll speak from perspective of the United States, about seven to 8,000 people will suffer a serious snake bite. Um, and so that means that they went to a hospital and received antivenom, you know, That's and this each year. Yeah. Each year. Yeah. Um, and so, and this is like, it's actually there, you know, despite the um, stereotype of like, you know, a, a drunk guy grabbing a snake, you know, like hold, hold, hold my beer. I'm going to grab that snake. That's actually not really true. Um, that does happen, but most snake bites are accidents, um, even in the United States. Um, so, and there's, there's research papers that back this up, you know, people are, they're hiking on trails. They get tagged by a rattlesnake. Um, you know, again, they're clearing in their wood piles in the winter and, you know, they get bitten by something that's hiding in the wood pile. Um, or they accidentally step on a snake in the garden. Well, you know, there's many ways that people encounter snakes. Um, so seven, 8,000 people get a serious snake bite, but only five to six people will die. It's crazy low. Um, but we have great healthcare and you know, the same in uh, Canada. You guys will probably pay less for a venomous snake bite than us Americans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, cause yeah, that's a whole nother topic, but um, so, but we can be treated right. Despite the healthcare costs. Cause a, a snake bite is, you know, it could be, hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, to treat, um, cause it is expensive to treat. Um, but you'll survive, you will survive that snake bite. And like, so we have a collection of snakes here. And if I was bitten by one of our snakes, um, like one of our rattlesnake species, like I would be at a hospital in 15 minutes and I would survive. No, no question. Um, however, people living in rural communities around the world, um, if they're bitten first, they, may take hours to sometimes even longer. It could even be a whole day to get to a place where there is antivenom. Um, and so the access to proper medical treatment is a big factor. Um, if, but secondly, they may not choose to go to a hospital with antivenom. Mm -hmm. There's um, in many parts of the world, there's um, hesitancy about going to a doctor because of the risk of anaphylactic shock, which can come from um, cheaper varieties of antivenom or like poorly designed antivenoms. Um, and then also too, they might believe that their local uh, shaman or traditional healer will be able to actually s stop the venom using, you know, various methods. So like every country has different ways to treat snake bite from their traditional mm -hmm. healers. Um, but we know as a fact that antivenom is the only treatment for for snake bite. And so, you know, so it's this, it's this vicious circle of like, okay, first you have to get people to understand they have to get antivenom. They have to go to the hospital, but when they get to the hospital, we also need to have doctors that can treat it. And there's a lot of bad information that even doctors may not know about treating snake bite. Um, or when someone has systemic effects, like, you know, um, uh, from the snake bite. So, you know, you have to treat all of those things at the same time. And so as people can actually, you know, from like an elapid bite, they can lose the ability to continue breathing, um, mm. you know, so they're, you know, they become paralyzed or unable to breathe. And so if the hospital doesn't have a ventilator, you know, you have someone on one of those ventilator bags constantly, you know, and this, that can be really difficult for hospital staff if you have other issues going on in the hospital. Um, so long story short, for snake bite in other parts of the world, um, it's, it's a tough, you know, it's a tough situation. And we see this in the numbers too, because it's like the world's health organization, they have numbers on this, that it's like about like 80 to a hundred thousand people each year die from snake bite. And the number is really varied because it's, these numbers are likely under estimates because they come from uh, like hospital records. Right. Mm -hmm. And so again, maybe not everyone gets to the hospital and they're kind of recorded. Right. Um, so people may die, um, you know, because they didn't get to hospital, they went to a traditional healer. And so it's, it's likely like, you know, 80 to 125,000 is really low on the, on the scale. But secondly, uh, and this might even be more alarming is that like upwards of 400,000 people every single year get maimed from a snake bite. 
Um, and so you may know this and your audience may know this, but like when you get a, a, a bite, especially from like a pit viper species, time is tissue. You know, the longer that that venom is in your body, it is just melting <laughs> your, your skin. It's, and so to the point, if it takes eight hours to get to a hospital and you've had a, you know, a cytotoxic or hemotoxic snake bite, you know, you're going to lose limbs, right? It can, right. the venom is going to spread and it's basically just going to make your arm or wherever you're the bite, um, you know, useless at some point. And so that's a big part of it as well is that, and so when people are bitten and you have 400,000 people that might survive the snake bite, but then they're permanently disabled, you know, if they were the breadwinner in the family, they can't work and provide a livelihood for their families. And so you have, you know, 400,000 people, you know, and their families, you know, which could be millions of people that because of snake bite are thrown into poverty or in greater poverty, most likely, um, because usually it's the the most poor and the most rural who are the most impacted by snake bite. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, well, and it's, you know, there's something about well, partly in North America, especially in Canada, we don't really have venomous snakes here. There's a you know, species of prairie rattlesnake and whatnot, not where I live. So we're kind of protected from that. And even in the U S as you said, the medical system is good and the snake bites aren't, it's not like there's mambas zooming around that can kill you in real, in a sort of a really quick amount of time. Yeah. And there's something about, it's almost like mythological, the fact that an animal is capable of biting you and injecting something into your body that will slowly melt your limbs away or just stop your heart or stop you from breathing. And you can, it, it reminds me of the way, like if you're a contractor or a construction worker, if, if you're someone that does framing, like like mm -hmm. building the wood frame, you will not touch electricity. You may like yeah. mess with uh, plumbing and you might do some other things, but the electrician is does the electrician, the, all the electrical work because there's that mass unknown and people don't really understand how electricity works. It's like, I just know I don't put my fingers there because I'm yeah. going to get some zap and it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's kind of how I see the snake world as well. Like there's just, there is a good reason to be very fearful of these animals. And especially like in these scenarios that you're painting, like people are getting bitten, they're losing their livelihood and whatnot. So it's impossible not, you, you cannot blame the people for feeling that way, especially yeah. because you have incredibly venomous snakes that could end up in their homes sort of at any time. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a huge challenge. Yeah. And to add to that, like, that's actually something as an organization that we really put first and foremost, like we, we honor respect and have great sympathy for people who want to protect their families. They want to protect their livestock. You know, they want to protect their pets, like, or, or their, mm -hmm. or their children. They, uh, it, you know, you can't, you can't fault people for that. And so, but what we can do is give those same people that live am among venomous snakes tools to be able to reduce the conflict, right? And the great thing about snake bite is that, you know, it's not that hard to avoid, right? It's with some basic information, you know, we, we could prevent snake, snake bite. And that's, as an organization, that's what we support is the prevention side of snake bite and empowering people to coexist with snakes. And so, and a big reason that we were founded is because in 2017, the World Health Organization declared snake bite a neglected tropical disease. And so in the U.S., so we're a U.S. Um, nonprofit organization. We were like rushed to get, you know, set up in 2017 because we knew that if we're going to say that snake bite is a disease, snakes cause disease, um, snakes are like mosquitoes. They need to be eradicated. Like that, that's the trajectory that I saw. And I wanted to put that vision into our organization that, okay, no, snakes are a critically important part of our world's biodiversity. If you take snakes out of an ecosystem, you know, <laughs> you know, birds that eat snakes are not going to have their prey, you know, even monkeys eat snakes, you know, so there's a lot of animals that eat snakes for their prey. And then snakes are an incredible, um, you know, form of pest control. So they're an important predator themselves, obviously. And if you, you remove them, it's going to really, you know, dismantle ecosystems around the planet. And likelihood of fully eradicating snakes is not a real option. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like they're, unfortunately, some snakes are so common, like even highly venomous ones, you could not eradicate all of them. Um, and so it's a much more economic option to give a little bit of information to people so that they're able to make decisions themselves to keep themselves safe. And I, I like to compare this, you know, with like, again, living in a city, 
we know that we use stop signs or, or stoplights to like cross roads and we know to watch for traffic. You know, we know that, you know, if there's construction, maybe we go like a little further out. So something doesn't fall on our head. You know, um, we learn these really basic things at a very young age about how to live in our world, but in other parts of the the world and even in the United States and in Canada as well, where, well, where there's rattlesnakes, you learn to be cautious, right? But accidents yeah. still happen. And so we just want to make sure that everyone has that right information to be able to make smart decisions about living with snakes. Because until we have people that are, you know, empowered to live with snakes and able to really, you know, just live with them, literally, um, then we can start looking at the conservation efforts of snakes. Right. Because if, if people can accept that snakes like live around them and they know what to do when they see a snake and it's not necessarily to kill it immediately, then we can start actually going out and doing research on king cobras, uh, protecting rare vipers in Brazil um, or whatever other species that needs conservation action. And it, it has to start with, you know, the education and getting the communities involved so that they're also able to help us with the conservation efforts. And when I say us, I mean people who are actually doing the conservation work. And right. a, a big part of that is supporting people from those communities to do the work themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you just kind of run through just in general, how Save the Snakes works? Like how do you get into those communities and what, what how, how are you operating in a way that can help these communities or educate them so we you can kind of check that first box so we can, you know, get people being okay with living with them so we can move over to the conversation or the, the conser conservation. Right. Yeah, I think there's... um there's kind of a few ways to answer that question. So, but I'll start with kind of like the need itself too, because when a, another big issue with, you know, not only snake bite and stuff um, and then kind of like bridging the gap between human snake conflict and protecting rare snake species, it's funding. It's trying to find mm. money for those programs. So if, for example, if you're a researcher, you know, that you know, you're in Nepal, you're working to save King Cobras, and okay, so where are you going to find funds to do your work? You know, because the local communities are not going to be able to support that work, right? So here in the US, I can ask my community, you know, of wealthy, you know, generally wealthy people, people who have money to give, and they will help me support my efforts. But in Nepal, it's like people, they, there isn't that philanthropic idea. Like it's a very Western concept to have people donate funds, right, for a project or something. And so, where do those people who are doing this important work around the world find their funds? Well, it's, they have to go abroad. And so conservationists usually apply for funding from zoological institutions, foundations, um, you know, wealthy benefactors, if it's a certain species. And so if you want to start a project, it can be really tough to find that initial funding. And then if you're not known in these wildlife conservation communities, kind of getting your foot in the door can even be even harder. And so I'd say the snakes sought to do is help get people off the ground who are doing this important work. Mm. Um, and so that's why the first thing we did was launch a grant program. And so, so we have like gifts on our website and we um, allow people to donate. And so basically we, we can kind of like piecemeal funds together. And so that every single year we can give out award, well, grants, they're actually grants to people who are doing this work. And those conservationists can apply for those grants because those same conservationists, when they go out and apply for funding, they're usually competing with like elephants, uh, pangolins, tigers, really charismatic species that like a zoo, you know, when they get, you know, all the grant proposals um, from these conservationists around the world, they're like, who do I need to fund? The snakes are always going to be low on the list, right? Yeah. Because who wants to support snake conservation? It's like, okay, if there's like a pangolin project, everyone wants to say pangolins. I want to say pangolins. Like they're awesome, you know, yeah. but the snakes are going to be low on the totem pole for funding. Um, and so we prioritize that funding, right? So if it's a rare snake species, if it's, um, a, you know, that's kind of like number one, it's like rare, you know, endangered snake species. Um, and if there's a community element to it, so that if the conservationist is working directly with the community, um, those are the projects we support. So education, and community outreach, because we feel that's the best way to start a, a conservation project or, or to help a conservation project get to the next level. Because again, once the communities are on board, they're engaged, they're like, yeah, let's 
save these snakes. Um, you start finding people in those communities that want to help the conservationist, um, you know, and they become, you know, volunteers. That program starts growing. And then before you know it, you have a team of people um, from that community that are going to save that snake species. And it's mm -hmm. it's this little model of funding that we've been able to sort of, you know, give around the world. Um, and we've been able to support um, a, about two dozen projects and I think 14 or 15 countries around the world. I actually don't know the exact number I should. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that, that is amazing. Yeah. And and this, you know, this concept of teaching people to be um, have pride in the species that live around them, right? right. And you transition right. them from this fear and they hate these animals and you want to kill them when you see them to being to realizing you may be one of the very few communities that actually has this animal living in that area and how do you make it so people go, you know, maybe they start putting it on a, not their country flag, but flags or right. posters and whatnot so they can feel like you know, people might come to our location just to see this animal and we want to be, you know, have pride in that. Yeah. And that, that's a big part of it too. Like, cause that's been successful with other species, right? So some, some rare, you know, plants, even birds and, you know, giving you this, this sense of pride for this animal, like that's another tool in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. Um, I think our, our number one aim though, is just to give people, um, breathing room about these animals because like it's, you know, because when we first started out, we were we were like, all right, maybe we can try and get people to appreciate snakes. And it's we're finding that we can get people to accept that they exist. Like, like <laughs> they're like, okay, I don't want them in my home. I don't want them in my my immediate area. But I'm okay if they're in the forest. Like that's it. <laughs> like, and that's good enough because that's that's um, enough that they won't go out and kill them. And they might go call a snake rescuer to go and get the snake if they see one in their area. Um, you know, it's, and, and I totally get it. Cause again, these animals, you know, humans have been coexisting with snakes for, you know, as long as our species has been on this planet. Right. And so we, I, we have like, like the fear is real, you know, like yeah. <laughs> the weird primates, snakes eat primates, you know, it's, it's, it's a, no good. <laughs> it's no yeah. good. So it's, um, so trying to really, um, you know, there, there will be people in those communities though, that will go above and beyond that will become so passionate. And we've seen that in the people we've supported um, where they, they get these incredible teams together of people who are so passionate and they become stewards for the species. And like, they're the ones that are really passionate about it. And they kind of become like uh, just, I don't know, like uh, just like liaisons for snake conservation, because mm -hmm. when someone in their network finds a snake, they're going to be the person they call. And so they will go out and rescue the snake. Um, and then they'll be able to consult with the, the family or, you know, the workplace about, okay, how did the snake get in there? And like, you know, what was it doing? And okay, maybe we can prevent that from happening in the future. It kind of gives people like, a, it's like, the, it's you can almost think of it like the fire department or the our pest control service, but like, but a, a wildlife conservationist, um, you know, because in many places where these snakes, you know, live, they don't have those systems. Like if you have wildlife, that's, you know, like whether it's a leopard or like, you know, a, you know, a weasel getting into your house or something, you, you deal with it yourself. You know, you don't call somebody. Um, there might be some, you know, game wardens that will come out um, in some parts of the world, but other usually for rural populations, they have to deal with these problems themselves. And so by giving people not only the tools to know what to do when they see a snake, um, if they feel like they can't get it out of their house or out of their workplace, they call someone that is in their community to do it. And so, and we found that this has been a successful way to mitigate the conflict. And then the conservationists who are working in those communities can go and start doing research on the snakes and start doing these longer uh, conservation projects. Yeah, yeah, I like the fire the fire department example. It's like, why did my house burn down? Well, you left the element on. So why did the yeah. snake get into your home? Well, you you kind of left the door open, or, or you left this opportunity for it to want to come in. And so, can you give us a few examples of a few of the grants that Save the Snakes has provided, and and some of the projects that have kind of happened under that umbrella? Yeah. So there's um, so there's the grants that we've supported just kind of like on a one-time basis. Um, and I like to think of that there are support grants. There really are seed grants. Um, a, a fantastic one that I, I really like to talk about is in Colombia. Um, uh, uh, Julio Mor uh, Morales is a, a conservationist 
that is working with the Hoshul's forest racer. And so this snake is pretty interesting. It's a, a colubrid species, um, pretty, I don't know, just a, a pretty green snake, but it was lost to science for 70 years. And um, his team actually rediscovered it um, in a preserve in Colombia. And so his project was working with communities that were like on the border of the, the reserve so that basically saying, hey, if you see this snake, call me, <laughs> don't kill it, don't kill the yeah. snake. And so basically it was providing, you know, not only information about like finding the snake. So this incredibly rare snake who's now known from only a few specimens in the world. Um, so it's like, okay, if you see the snake, call me, but here's information about other snakes. And so like, you know, here's like the vipers you need to be concerned about. Um, here are the boa constrictors and those species that you don't, don't need to worry about at all. And they're a good form of pest control. Um, so basically what he created is that all the communities surrounding this protected area where the, he knows the snake is, if that snake is ever found out of this protected area, or if, you know, those, you know, community members are visiting the protected area, they will call him. They will say like, Hey, I saw the snake, you know? And so his researchers will start looking for the snake. And then basically it's just, you have a bunch, way more eyes being able to discover this, you know, critically endangered species of snake in Colombia. So um, when he was starting his research, was that couldn't have been the plan then, I assume. He wasn't going out there to look for that species, or or was that kind of in the back of his head? I believe it started that he was just doing herpetofaunal species in a, a particular reserves in um, in Colombia. And then okay. it was discovered, and it was like, oh, this is something special. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so that's many times how it happens, right? So you know, people are just doing surveys, whether with the university or just they're maybe doing their PhD or a master's or the equivalent of a master's. And then they find something truly special and that derails them. And they're like, I need to focus on this. And, and I think in his case, that was what had happened. And so now he is, you know, kind of his, uh, his work is centered around not only saving the snake, but, you know, engaging the communities to help protect it as well. Mm. So, yeah, that is amazing. What yeah. a great story too to to have under that umbrella. That's amazing, and, and something that I had heard you say on something else I was listening to was the issue with relocating snakes. Which I, I'm not sure. I think I may have heard this before, but it was I mean, it's sort of ringing a bell. But you could re-describe this for people when people find snakes and they think, okay, well, it's living in my area. Like you said, I'm okay with it living in the forest. I just don't want it near me. Yeah. So you know, part of a you know the idea could be taking the snake and moving it 20 miles one direction. But that actually is a, a horrible way to 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 move snakes. Can, can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And actually a lot of the projects we support usually have a component of like the conservationist who is relocating snakes. Like he's, he or she will actually be out in those communities and giving education programs. And then as a result of speaking to so many people, they're going to get calls and they're going to like, Hey, I have a snake in my house. Come get it. And they'll do that. And so relocation is constantly on our minds. Um, mm -hmm. So the science is a, uh, pretty clear for certain species like that if you move snakes outside of their home range so snakes actually have home ranges right um, they you know have areas of land and it's it's it varies between species um, of how much space they need but they know where their water sources are they know where their like winter brumation sites are or you know that awesome rocky outcrop where you know all the mice run by um, to put it simply right but mm -hmm. they, they know their, their space and they use that environment to survive. And so for some species like vipers, you know, they may only have like a few square kilometers of area that they use. And so when you take them out of it, um, you know, I, I like to say it's like the equivalent if you drop me in the middle of like the rainforest in Borneo and, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm naked, no cell phone, <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, geez, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to get my food. I don't. I don't know anything. Um, and so we see this kind of like when snakes are relocated outside of their home range, they, um, they, they like, they're naive to the environment. And so there's some studies out there that are pretty interesting. Like for example, King Cobras, um, there's a great group in Thailand that has been studying King Cobras for years. And they looked at relocating snakes, you know, in home ranges and then outside their home ranges. And they put transmitters in snakes and they tracked them. And in their home ranges, if you looked at like a, like a, like a map and of like a snake, like kind of moving around the environment, it's like when a snake knows where it is, it kind of, it'll go to a spot, hang out, 
you know, then it might go to another spot, hang out, hang out, you know, it's just kind of hanging out in different spaces, not making real big movements. It's just, it's just, they're kind of hanging out in certain areas for a small amount of time. Then they'll go to a different area. Um, casual movements, I, I guess I would say like they're, you know, foraging or resting in certain areas. Um, however, this group of researchers, they found that when you move a sink outside of its home range, they move in straight lines. And they just are trying to get back to a place that's familiar. And so what happens is those king cobras, they're because they're huge snakes and they do have large home ranges, um, they're going to move large distances, straight lines. They come into contact with people. They cross roads. They get attacked by predators because they don't know necessarily those safe places to be. And so they're more likely to get killed. Um, with smaller species, so like, for example, um, pit vipers in North America, you know, like you move a rattlesnake outside of its home range. And this is really common that now relocating snakes is becoming, you know, the ethical thing to do, right? Which is good. Except that if you have like a snake relocator that takes a snake out in the middle of the desert and it's like, okay, you were found in this, you know, backyard in Phoenix, I'm going to go dump you in the desert at like 12 in, you know, the afternoon and no, not putting it in a burrow, just putting it out in the, it's going to die of exposure in like 20 minutes. Um, so that's another concern that when relocating snakes, we have to look at the microclimate. So like where those snakes like were coming from and putting it directly to a similar place. Um, Cause sometimes it's not always easy just to, you know, take the snake around the property and, and release it there, but that's what we advocate. And so we, and we do it in a way of like, not only here in North America, but abroad as well, like our conservationists try and get the snakes relocated just to the nearest appropriate habitat. And that literally could be a few hundred feet from where it was found. Um, and we try and, um, you know, provide information to landowners or people in that community say like, okay, if, if you, we could move this snake really far away, but there's just another chance a different snake is going to be here. And so it's like by removing the snake or killing the snake, that doesn't solve the problem because another snake is going to come here. You know, there was a reason the snake was in that environment, right? Like there's rodents in the barn. There's a water source. Uh, there's, you know, a big foundation that the snakes can, there's, there's habitat, like it can rest. Um, there's a reason the snakes were there. And so what we're finding though, is that close relocations is like the best bet. And then, greater than half a mile is kind of like the limit it seems from the research but um there is sort of a gap and there's many people in i know in the united states that are studying this and actually there's a few researchers abroad too that are looking at like short translocations versus long translocations um because we do need more evidence like what's what's the sweet spot and it's going to be different for different species because like a large king cobra you know you could probably move it much further than like you know a little viper species that has a small home range. Um, so, but yeah, luckily the, there's a lot of great resources online. So I, I do want to plug the, um, the, it's a free snake relocation directory. That's actually a Facebook group for people. in I think it's North America, but it might be, be just the United States. I'm actually not sure. Um, but it's just a group of researchers or not researchers, a group of snake enthusiasts that will remove snakes for free. And, their kind of guidelines are that they move it as close to where it was found. And so it kind of provides like a free resource for people that, you know, may not have to get pest control or a fire department to come out. They might be able to find like a local snake rescuer who knows a lot about the species who will be able to relocate it um, for them for free. Do snakes in the States end up in people's homes quite often? I feel like it doesn't happen that often considering, you know, most people have relatively sealed homes and whatnot compared to a third world country or something. Yeah, it's. It, I think it's mostly just in people's yards. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. So like, because you know, if there's a gap like under a fence, you know, a snake's gonna get through it. Um, yeah. Exactly. You know, snakes are really good at that. Um, but sometimes you find them in like their garages. But yeah, in general, like the infrastructure of homes is is usually more sealed. Um, in other parts of the world, you know, people may live in homes that have completely open windows, completely open doors. And so that allows snakes to enter. And if, mm -hmm. you know, and it makes sense, like a nice, you know, building with open doors is going to be much cooler than, you know, the outside environment, especially in hot places in the world. Um, so, you know, snakes are more commonly seen in homes. Um, like one of our projects in South Africa, 
they uh you know they get black mambas up in people's roofs like yeah pretty commonly and <laughs> like you can imagine you know having like a 10 foot black mamba in your roof that would be a disconcerting experience yeah yeah you're so. definitely calling the snake mover on that day yeah yeah and that's that's one thing because certain places have more like rescuers and other places like south africa does have like a, a pretty large community of snake people that are able to remove these snakes um but another project that we support in zambia that's not the case and so um you know trying to get more people trained up is a really a, another important part of our programs is that you know we have conservationists that are trained to work with snakes and to rescue and relocate venomous snakes and then they train other people to do it so to provide that service for members in their community well yeah maybe we can talk a little bit about the venomous handling courses as well because i know that's a service that you guys are something that you provide in the states and i guess it's probably something that you can carbon copy for the other countries as well so can you yeah. talk a little bit about how that works yeah and it's kind of based off the simple idea that um you know we think that people should be empowered to handle a venomous snake like mm -hmm. it's um it's not as um scary as it sounds like it it, it can it can be dangerous right but, um, you know, especially if you watch certain YouTube channels, you'll, uh, there's some yeah. bad information. They're about always to, trying to bite you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, um, you know, and like, we, we want to give people the, the most safe and the most professional techniques to be able to relocate a snake out their home. Because yeah, like, for example, in California, there's some rescuer like companies that will remove a snake from your home. Uh, it's going to charge about $150 for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm for someone just to put a snake in a bucket. Um, <laughs> wow. And it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. And so, you know, so we offer courses here in California so that landowners that have snakes or, you know, utility workers, first responders, um, you know, people that work with snakes often like biologists too. We, we talk to um, and teach a lot of biologists, you know, how to safely, you know, relocate snakes. Um, Cause we do have a lot of rattlesnakes in California. And so, it makes sense to be able to just have the basic training to, to remove them. Um, but part of that is also teaching about snake bite and the, what to do in a snake bite situation, um, how to prepare staff and family for snake bite situation. Cause that's actually something that's not taught as well. Um, very often, like you can take a first aid course. Um, and maybe if you take like a wilderness first aid course, they'll cover snake bite for five minutes and they'll, they'll just say like, go to a hospital. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. but it's it's a little more complicated than that. And so the courses that we teach in the United States are a combination of like, yeah, snake bite, first aid, uh, you know, snake ecology, like what snakes are around, how do they use the environment? Because again, more people that know about like, why is a the snake there in their yard, they'll understand like, oh, okay, I can prevent that in the future. Um, and then, yeah, we give people hands-on training about how to safely um, you know, contain a snake in a bucket, in a bag, and then put it into a bucket or another container device, um, you know, using snake hooks and tongs or even simple tools that they might find around their house, like a broom. A broom in a trash bag is a, a very effective, uh, not trash bag, a trash um, container is a yeah, good yeah. a good way to... Trash bag may not yeah. work quite as well. No, I wouldn't recommend the trash bag. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And this, but it, it, especially yeah. if you're just simply moving the animal, you're not handling it, you're not trying to tube it or anything. It's actually, yeah. I mean, not that I've ever done it, but it's not like you're doing anything mechanically that difficult. You have lots of distance right. and you can keep control of the animal fairly simply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, I would say driving is way more dangerous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, but jokes aside, like, um, because we, we really do take it seriously. It's, um, uh, it's safe. It's about being safe and keeping people safe, but also just, Again, giving people more information so that they're able to, you know, live comfortably in snake habitat. Because especially in California, there are many people that live in the foothills and these really beautiful, you know, rocky, you know, great rattlesnake habitat. And it's, you know, beautiful place to live, but the snakes love that habitat as well. And so it's a common thing to encounter snakes. And so, and people just don't want to constantly either be calling a pest control service or a relocator. They just want to be able to do it themselves. Yeah. Um, and so what, what are some of the things you recommend if someone does take a bite besides just go to the hospital? What, what are some steps that people can go through if that does happen? Yeah. So in a bite. So I think the first important thing is to understand that a bite from any venomous snake is a, a life threatening emergency and getting to a hospital 
uh, or emergency services is really the first thing uh, that they want to do. Uh, don't wait. Don't because uh, there's a lot of bad information about, well, it could be a dry bite. Right. So the snake yeah. did not in, actually envenomate. And that does happen. Um, it's however, you should not take the time to wait because the longer you should find that out at the hospital. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so and I'll also add to that, not only is there like that hesitancy to, um, you know, wait to see if it's actual envenomation. So why go to the hospital um, in the United States? Like it is expensive. It's and if someone does not have health insurance, um, it can be you know, it can make you bankrupt. Um, so that's another reason why I can understand why people may not go to a hospital, you know, like an ambulance, for example, can be $12,000. Um, yeah. Yeah. However, again, I, I harp on that because it's, it's an unfortunate reality that some people may have to deal with. Um, but if you are in that situation, getting to emergency services is the best thing to do. Um, but there's so, you know, if you are in a situation where you're bitten by a snake, whether you're out in the trail, you're in your backyard, um, it's important to, you know, identify the snake first and foremost, um, you know, is it actually a rattlesnake or is it a, you know, cotton mouth or a coral snake or coral snake bites are actually really, really, really rare. Uh, so I shouldn't mention that, <laughs> but cotton mouse and rattlesnakes are kind of the main culprits in the United States, um, copperheads too. Um, and so identify the snake. It's like, yep, that's a, a rattlesnake. I need to go to the hospital. Uh, keeping calm is really important. So the calmer we are it, you know, it, keeping our heart rate low, it's like it, it allows the venom to kind of move slower through our body if mm. we maintain calm composure. Um, uh, actually, and venom doesn't travel through blood. It actually travels through our lymphatic system. Uh, so how we move our muscles is really important too. And so at the bite location, you actually want to keep it um, neutral or slightly elevated to your heart. So keeping in that neutral position. Um, and that is just going to keep the venom from moving too, too quickly through the body. Um, however, you do want there to be some flow. And this is why we don't want to put on a tourniquet to stop flow. Cause then that's going to isolate the venom to one area and it'll actually do more damage. So we want kind of a natural spread of venom, but we don't want it going too fast. So it's, I like to think of it as like the Goldilocks of where venom is in our body. Uh, just right. You want that right. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So keeping calm, um, you know, elevating that bite. So if it's on the ankle or I'm elevating or keeping it neutral. And when I say elevate, it's like slightly elevated, not like have your arm all the way up. It would just, you know, draw right above the heart. Um, and then you want to mark the bite. This is actually really important. So marking where you did have a bite. So if you're bidding on the hand, um, of course, you know, so Sharpies are a great thing for first aid kit, mark the bite, uh, circle, uh, the extent of the swelling, um, and then put a time. And the reason you mark the time is because if you put that on a piece of paper, put it in your phone, um, you can lose it. And doctors really need to know when that, um, when that bite occurred. And by marking the extent of the swelling, their doctors are also going to look at that and they're going to, that's going to help them to prescribe antivenom and how much they're going to give you. Um, and then, uh, remove tight fitting jewelry. So if you have a rings or bracelets, um, clothes, you know, um, if you're bitten on the leg, you actually might want to, um, shear your pants so that it allows your body to swell. Swelling is good. We want our bodies to swell, um, and then get to a hospital, um, as quick as possible. So, and we always recommend calling an ambulance or having emergency services come to you or having someone take you because, um, your local effects. So like, right, if you're bitten, you're going to have pain, you're going to have swelling, bruising, and a few other symptoms, but you can also have some sim um, um, uh, symptoms that are occurring elsewhere in parts of your body. So a tachycardia, you could be having uh, diarrhea, vomiting. You can have these really um, uh, like sessions of um, feeling lightheaded, dizzy, uh, venom does really weird things to the body and it's not the same for every people. And so you should not be operating a vehicle if you have been bitten by a venom no. snake. Yeah. And so, so having, and the best thing is even if like you do have someone with you, you should have emergency services come to you because you want, you know, if you go into cardiac arrest, you, you know, you want there to be people, you know, with a defibrillator and all that stuff and the, the oxygen and, and trained personnel that can treat those services. Um, and so one also thing I, I did forget to mention. So if you're calling 911, right, or, or the equivalent in other countries, um, you also want to contact your local poison control. 
um, because in the United States, so 911, when you call them, they're, that's going to direct the emergency services to come to your location and get you a hospital. Um, poison control is actually going to figure out, okay, you were bitten by this snake. We need to make sure that wherever you're going has the anti-venom because not every hospital will have anti-venom. And you don't want to be the one that figures that out. Like, you know, if your local hospital has anti-venom, it's like have the service that does that. And in this case for a snake bite, it's poison control. So calling both numbers is, is pretty important. Okay. Yeah. That is, yeah. Extremely valuable information. I didn't realize about the poison control and I guess there should be anti-venom in the area for the snakes. If there's no native snakes, typically I yeah. imagine that that circulates pretty commonly. And, and luckily in, in North America, so we, um, so I guess Canada and United States, cause there are some species in Mexico that are a little, little different, but, um, you know, we are treated with one or two types of anti-venom. Mostly it's Crofab, which is the anti-venom for the North American pit viper. So that's, yeah copperheads, um, cotton mouse, and then our rattlesnake species. And it's pretty, it's pretty easy to treat a snake bite now. Um, it's like the last 10 years, snake bite treatment has gone from being really um, kind of a nerve wracking experience for doctors. Um, and also because of this risk of anaphylactic shock. And this is something that was really common, you know, a couple of decades ago. Um, that when someone was treated by anti, um, with anti-venom, there was this big risk that they would have an allergic reaction to the anti-venom. Right. And now we don't have that because we have better anti-venoms that um, at the molecular structure, when they create these, they get all the impurities out and it's a great product. And so now when you get to a hospital, they just dump a ton of anti-venom on you and they, they wait and see how your symptoms prevail. And that's why we have very little deaths from snake bite. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's good to treat. I'll mention something else too um, that does happen still, but not as much, is that if you have a, a snake bite, you know, especially with a, a North American pit viper, your arm or wherever you're bitten is going to swell. The bite is going to mm. swell, swell, swell. And so much, I mean, if you've ever seen a snake bite, um, they're pretty gnarly. Um, like a balloon. Yeah, like really. I think I know where you're about to go. Before yes. you go there, of course. can I ask you when you say the swelling is beneficial, is that just because it's sort of diluting the venom or why is the swelling beneficial before well, you get into the next part? There? I guess before I say it's it's beneficial, I should say it's natural. It's, okay. it's yeah. natural and our bodies can handle the swelling. Um, but there, and, and so when yeah. So that's, that's, kind of, it would be more correct for me to say that it's a natural thing for that to happen. Yeah. Okay. That and so, yeah. yeah, by removing the the tight fitting jewelry and the clothes, that's just going to allow our body to swell. And then also too, as that swelling happens again, you know, it's going to be moving our lymphatic fluids through our body. So the, the swelling is going to, uh, the venom is going to be, you know, slowly going through our body. And we do want that a little bit of swelling, that little bit of movement of fluids, um, Again, that sweet spot. We don't want it to be too much because then, you know, the more venom that goes through our body can make symptoms happen very, very quickly, um, like very bad symptoms. And if you keep that venom in one spot, it's just going to, again, melt, melt your yeah, yeah. body. And so if you get to a hospital and you have massive swelling, um, doctors look at that. And they want to treat something called compartment syndrome. And so if you ever have like, not, not to get too gross um, and, you know, yeah, give bad images, but if, if there's ever like a crushing wound, like if there was like a, a car accident and like you, you had your arm smashed and then so your arm swells up and it's, you know, pretty gnarly and intense accidents, um, your body does not have the ability to regulate its swelling and to reduce swelling because it's basically like the nerves are crushed and it's just, um, and I'm not a doctor. And so I'm probably giving like the information is probably not exactly correct. I do want to give that, like, I'm not a snake bite expert. I'm not a doctor. So I do want to say that, but compartment syndrome is basically though, like your body can't regulate that swelling. So doctors want to treat that with something called a fasciotomy. And that's where they, they basically cut open the swelled area, allow it to reduce the swelling. And then they, you know, pack you full of gauze and they treat this giant um, cut. However, though, with a snake bite, your body will, with antivenom, the swelling will reduce. Um, like your, your nerves are still working fine. The, the, the system for swelling still works. And so, but when doctors see that, because they've received this other training about intense swelling, 
they immediately want to cut you open uh, and perform a fasciotomy. And so a lot of snake bites were treated um, in the United States with fasciotomies. And so like some herpers who are like are the older generations, they'll have these giant scars down their arm or down their leg where they had to reduce the swelling or like um, on their fingers too. And it's usually unnecessary. And so that's why when there is a snake bite situation, um, we do encourage people to if they're able to start reaching out to snake bite experts who are doctors as well. Um, and so luckily on Facebook, if you type in snake bite, there is a group. Um, I think it's the snake bite assist or snake bite 911, something like that, where if you have an active bite situation, you can start posting in that channel and snake bite experts donate their time who are also medical doctors to kind of basically being available to assist with doctors and so much that I've witnessed them not only, you know, providing information on the Facebook channel, but they will get in touch with doctors at other hospitals and say, Hey, you're treating wow. this wrong, or you need to do something differently. Uh, and so it's, it is quite amazing that these doctors who are also snake bite experts, like donate their time in this way. And so only a positive Facebook group. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I know good <laughs> use amazing. for social media. Yeah, um, yeah. And so if you do work or live around snakes, I, I do recommend like figuring out who those experts are in your area so you can bug them <laughs> if you ever get yeah, bitten. Yeah. Um, but it just it just goes to show that like, you know, it's it is easy to connect with experts in our, you know, with our digital world right now. And there's people out there that have the right information. And so I think it's like a little bit of a public service announcement that like if you do have a snake bite, you know, with antivenom, you can be treated, you will survive, most likely you'll survive, right? It's a pretty high chance of survival. And a fasciotomy is usually unnecessary. Um, and so as we work on venomous snakes, we want to put that information out there. Because yeah, fasciotomy is like a, a very, a terrible treatment um, for, yeah. for snake bite. It just, it's not usually necessary. Yeah, I'll let people Google that so they can. I won't put it in the video because yeah, the, the actual <laughs> when, when they're opened, it's like wow, that is an aggressive uh, medical procedure. And then, the, like you said, the scar can be really brutal. A lot right. of times, there needs to be grafting and whatnot after, and it can yeah. be pretty bad. So, as far as the animals that you have behind you, you have a few venomous snakes. You said rattlesnakes and whatnot. Yeah, what what is behind you, and then what what are the purpose of you guys keeping those? So these, this is, um, I guess like we call them like our ambassador animal. So they're used for education and outreach. And so a lot of these events we take to events, um, we take, um, them to schools and, you know, so this is kind of like the way that we work within our community in Northern California. Um, but, and then we also have animals that are in our teaching collection. So they're used for our venomous training programs. And so those animals are literally, you know, firsthand experience, you know, uh, a hands-off experience working with venomous snakes. And so, um, we have kind of a, all California native species. Um, so we have like for our non-venomous, like, like we have a few, ro a couple rosy boas cause they're, you know, they're rosy boas. They're good for showing kids, yeah. <laughs> but then yeah, we have a cute um, snake. Yeah. <laughs> Ironically though, actually our rosy boas are like really, um, food, um, like, not aggressive. Oh, motivated. Yeah, yeah, motivated. There you go. And so, like, you got to be a little careful some just because they're like going to try and eat your finger. Um, <laughs> but they're still cute. Uh, but then we have like colubrids. So, um, uh, so king snakes, gopher snakes. We actually use gopher snakes quite a bit because they're, you know, big, large snakes. And you can manipulating them on hooks is a kind of a good experience because they're, you know, they're big snakes to manipulate. Um, but then we have, um, uh, two Northern Pacific rattlesnakes. So, and that's the snake that we have around the Sacramento Bay area of California. That's our one rattlesnake species. And then to, because we do have people from Southern California take our courses, we have two Western diamondback rattlesnakes. Um, and both, both these species are really hardy. They do well with the trainings. Um, like, like we have this incredibly, I mean, I could show you if you want to see this rattlesnake, I can bring the camera over there. I don't know if that works. I mean, I'm not going to say no to that. Yeah. Let me, um... <laughs> if, that, if that's not too uh, much trouble now, he'll... for those listening can come back to the YouTube video and see. Oh, he'll, but he'll, he'll also put on a, a show too, because he's a, a very typical Atrox. Um, okay, great. So, yeah. So just, oh, yeah, there you go. Um, I'll bring it down to his level. Oh, oh yes. There's the. There's the buzz. Yeah. I'm not sure if you can see him, but the media, oh, yeah, we can see him. Yeah. yeah. So very, very typical. He doesn't like the camera for sure. Yeah. But and just a general about our, our setup here, I can kind of show you like, 
So we have our snakes in vision enclosures. Um, we have all kinds of things in the enclosures because we do provide actually enrichment. So different mm-hmm. surfaces, different hides, we rotate it out. Uh, but very important is we have cage cards on every single card that says, you know, what species it is, you know, what cage it is, and then if bitten, um, what to do. Um, and then also we have our locks, very critically yeah. important. Um, and so this room is also a sealed room so that it's locked and has um, no way that snakes can get out. Uh, it's pretty important for maintaining a collection of M6. Um, and the rattlesnake will stop in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I can't hear it anymore. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and so yeah. where is this room? This is in your the headquarters for Save the Snakes? Or? Yeah, so currently we, um, this is actually a new development for our organization. Again, our organization was founded in 2017. Um, the first two and a half years was mostly international snake conservation. So working from our laptop, writing grants, um, having a very small team trying to raise funds uh, for organizations abroad and raise funds for our support grants as well. Uh, But we really saw a need for kind of doing the same work in our own community in Northern California. People kill snakes. They, you know, they encounter snakes on their property. They, you know, people have a problem with snakes. So we wanted to help. And so by kind of, um, you know, going to schools and doing public events and now offering the training programs, we, we needed a place to be able to keep all this. Um, cause yeah, I have a child at home and uh, he can open doors now. He's like 17 yeah, yeah. months. So I don't want rattlesnakes at my personal home. Um, and so we share a space with another nonprofit organization who does, um, uh, conservation of like watersheds in California and luckily we have like this little office space. And so as our organization is growing, we're looking to expand that um, because especially we want to do more. Um, and the last year has been a monumental uh, growth period for our organization by offering the trainings and then just doing the public outreach and events. And the more growth we have, the more we're able to support uh, international state conservation efforts. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And as of right now, I think everybody that, is a part of save the snakes is a volunteer right and so yes. how, how, how do you as far as the future goes five ten years down the road what do you see it being the organization being yeah so we do have some pretty big goals that's for sure um we're so i often wonder you know what you know what do people think about save the snakes because you know it's besides what's on social media it's not like you know we get a lot of feedback and stuff um and i do I don't know how people think of our organization in terms of our size, because we are a very small organization um, as far as organizations go. And I like to be transparent about that when I talk to people. So people understand, like, so when they donate, you know, we're not paying staff, like we're all volunteers. Um, and so when people donate, like that money is hundred percent of it is going usually abroad to a conservation project. And so that's, um, I think really important, but as we grow, we're going to have some different needs, right? So if we had staff, like we would be able to, to grow the pie a lot more and offer more programs and do Mm -hmm. basically, um, you know, uh, conduct more of our mission. So, um, but in five, 10 years, like we, we really want a a space open to the public, um, located in Sacramento where we could have people come and, you know, visit our snakes and actually have, you know, beautifully naturalistic vivariums that talked about ecosystems from around the world um, that would paint the picture, you know, visually about like what our conservation partners are doing. You know, like if you can imagine like a snakes of South Africa, you know, exhibit and talking about different species, um, we would probably never ever have like um, uh, non-native venomous species due to the laws in California. and, And then also, uh, procuring anti-venom for like different venomous species is incredibly difficult. Um, and we're, it's, it's like not worth it to do that, but, um, but just have an open space that's available to the public that people can definitely learn about their native snakes. Um, but also, so we have a, a larger space to conduct our education programs, um, huge, but more importantly, by having a space like that, we, we want to, grow our international projects. And so, cause some of our projects have started as like grant projects, like just one, you know, one little support grant, but some of these projects have grown and we've been able to continue to support them over the years. And we want to be able to 
fully fund these programs. And so that these conservationists, like many of them are also volunteers. They do this, like, like we have people who are, you know, work at universities who do state conservation in their part-time people that have like a reptile park and they do it in their spare time, the conservation stuff. One of our conservation partners is actually an actor in, in wow. his country. Yeah. And he, you know, but he does all the community outreach when he has time. And so we would love it if these people could be full time, like they could be paid to do this work. Um, Cause you know, as important as this work is, you know, the people that do it, um, it's important that they're able to provide for themselves and their families. And, and we should be paying wildlife conservationists so that they can do this work a hundred percent and be totally dedicated to it. Um, and yeah, that's a good thing. And so if we grow as our organization, Save the Snakes, like in the U.S., we can grow our support for these international conservation programs to make sure that those species and the communities that live around them, you know, are thriving together. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And considering how far you've come just in the three to, you know, three and a half, four years from 2017, I don't doubt that that's where you'll be in the five to 10 years, because it seems like you guys have done a lot in a pretty short period of time. It's pretty incredible. Uh, thank you. But it, it really, I mean, uh, just to give a, a, a big shout out to the people who support our programs, like we couldn't do it without them, like their, you know, their support, you know, you know whether it's they buy a Save the Snakes t-shirt or they, you know, share our posts on social media, or if they graciously donate like that, those program or that, that funding is what makes our programs possible. So why don't we just, uh, we'll kind of end on on that detail as far as how people can help. You, you mentioned a few, but maybe you could just let us know where, where you can be found and, and how, if people want to financially support or buy some merch and whatnot, what can they do yeah. to help out? So if people want to support our organization, you know, they can visit online at save the snakes.org. They can, you can purchase an item from our, our gift shop. You can donate on our website pretty easily via your PayPal or credit card. Um, if you, you know, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and, uh, you know, Twitter, and we are in the process of growing our YouTube channel. It's very humble. So if you could subscribe, uh, we're trying to increase our content to be able to share the work of our conservation partners. So mm -hmm. by, you know, showcasing like, uh, a Southern African Python, you know, rescue and release, you know, or, you know, working with endangered pit vipers in Brazil. We want to show the work of our conservation partners in a, a media format that way. So check us out on there. Um, and if you're local to Sacramento or Northern California, get in touch with us. Um, so we are going to have an increased need for volunteer uh, a, volunteers in 2022. Um, but we also have our training program. And so I, if anyone is interested in learning more about venomous snakes, they can take um, our training programs. And then lastly, if you want to um, support Save the Snakes and travel, we are offering a, a Costa Rican eco tour in 2022. And so we'll take a group of, you know, wildlife enthusiasts and we'll see nesting sea turtles, strawberry, poison dart frogs, uh, you know, howler monkeys, toucans, and then we'll also see a lot of snakes. So. That is amazing. Costa Rica is a beautiful country, so someone has to take you up on that because that would be incredible. Where, where in Costa Rica do you guys go or do you just kind of go all over? We go all over. Yeah, we go yeah. to uh, both coasts um, from Tortuguero on the uh, Caribbean side, and then we go to the Pacific coast. Uh, yeah, and then a few spots in between. Uh, it's an incredible country, and we we travel with the most amazing conservationists that I know that will could tell you about anything in that country. And it's, it's really incredible. The, Amazing. Yeah. Well, and, and the, even the locals in Costa Rica, they have a very, like they're the nature mindset and they're, they're about keeping, preserving things. And, and they seem to have a lot of pride, pride in, in just the mother nature there. So it's, it's an amazing country to visit. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because that's a, that's from decades of, um, you know, working with communities to, yeah, to kind of what we were talking about at the beginning to be, have pride and, but also see value, monetary value in the biological resources there yeah. and giving people, um, an, an incentive to want to protect it because Costa Rica used to be like many other countries in Latin America. And they, you know, had many plantations were, had deforestation at alarming rate, but then this idea of ecotourism and sustainable travel was a much more marketable idea. And thus they've been able to protect one of the most biodiverse parts of our planet. So hopefully yeah. more countries will will follow suit. 
Um, yeah, Costa Rica does, you know, there is still some, you know, plantation deforestation issues, but like overall, it's a great model for sustainable yeah. ecotourism. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Well, Michael, I had a blast chatting with you. Is there anything that we didn't say today that you wanted to say before we left, or did we pretty much uh, hit hit all the points? Well, I just I I'd say you know um, I really welcome the opportunity to be you know on the show. This is um, you know, and I would love to engage your supporters. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So drop you know me a line at you know you can find my email on our website um, or find me on social media. But just you know, tell us you know, about what you're interested in snake conservation. And I'd also like to hear, where do you think we should go in the future? Like, are there things about snakes that are important to you that you would like to see protected? You know, we love to hear. So from supporters and from people, you know, like you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So for the listeners, that is a great call to action. Go say hi to Michael. And if you, I'm sure you'll hear from them. There's so many amazing people that listen to the show and they'll have some great ideas. So thank you so much for spending the time with me today, Michael. I absolutely love this conversation. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. All right. That is the end of that episode. Michael, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and joining me on an episode. That was a great conversation. And as all the listeners know, I am very much involved in conservation. I, I think conservation is one of the areas that as herpetoculture needs to be basically our primary focus. I think we should all be focusing on that in some way. So if you're not, if you're a listener and you're not already supporting a conservation program in some way, think about supporting Save the Snakes. Even if you just do a $5 donation once a year, those things add up. Everybody does that once a year. That adds up. You know, as the, the podcast itself, we donate to the Amazon Rainforest Conser- Conservation and or Conservancy. And I think any way we can help support conservancies or conservations, the better. And Save the Snakes would be a great option for you to do that. And if you don't have the financial support or financial needs to do that right now, just support them on Instagram. Give them a follow on Instagram. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel and just stay with your, your kind of finger on the pulse with what they're up to. And that always does help. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Again, head to the show notes, animalsathomenetwork.com. If you're looking for more information on this show or any links that we talked about during the episode, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash animalsathome. And you can find us on Instagram at animalsathomeca. And thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. And I think that's it for this week. Have a great week, everybody. And I will talk to you next Sunday.